This recording is on neurological presentations that present to the emergency department. First, let's look at three cases. Case one is a 32 year old female who's had two weeks of a progressively worsening headache. She was seen by her GP five days ago and he diagnosed a migraine. She was given painkillers that hadn't helped. She was seen by the doctor in the emergency department the neuro exam was normal and the patient did say that she'd been stressed recently at work. The diagnosis given by the ED doctor was a migraine and she was reassured and referred back to her GP. The second case is a 62 year old man, he had a headache for three days. The wife called an ambulance when she noticed his right arm was shaking uncontrollably. They stopped en route to the hospital. At the ED, the patient's arm is weaker, but improves over the next two hours, back to normal. He was diagnosed as having a TIA and discharged home for rapid access TIA clinic. Case three, 37 year old theatre nurse. She presented with a severe headache. Her neurological exam was normal and the headache resolves over the next few hours with fluids, antiemetics and chlorpromazine. She was diagnosed with migraine and discharged. So when is a headache just a headache? Let's look at those three cases again. Case one was the 32 year old lady who had two weeks of a severe headache um, diagnosed as a migraine in the ED. When she was discharged, it felt so bad she went back home to Ireland who looked after her mother. When she got off the plane, she was confused and vomiting and taken immediately to a local hospital. A CT scan was done. It showed a glioblastoma, multiform grade four with massive edema. She was intubated and airlifted to Dublin neurosurgical unit. Case two was the gentleman who presented with shaking of the arm and a headache, diagnosed as a TIA. He then represented to the emergency department 24 hours after discharge with unsteadiness and slurred speech, presumed to have a stroke. A CT scan of his brain was done and was found to have left parietal intraparenchymal mass with surrounding edema, likely a secondary brain tumour. In case three, the 37 year old theatre nurse who had a severe headache that did improve with fluids and antiemetics. Well, two weeks later, she was collecting her twin 18 month old boys from childcare, complained of a very severe headache and then collapsed and had a GCS of seven. On arrival at the UD, she was intubated and a CT brain showed a massive subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it's obviously clear that we need to try and make an accurate diagnosis of the cause of a headache and certainly that we should rule out any underlying serious pathology when we see this patient in the ED. To do that we should understand the pathophysiology of a headache and there are certain structures in the brain that cause pain. Um, these include the dura, the vessels, so the arteries and the veins, the venous sinuses, paranasal sinuses, the eyes, tympanic membranes and the cervical spine. And the pain can be transmitted through somatic afferents, um, cranial nerves 5, 7, 9 and 10, um, but also it can cause pain you can get with traction, inflammation or distension of those pain sensitive structures that we've just mentioned. So when we clinically approach a patient and assess their headache, we can categorize it into five different categories. The first one is altered GCS or focal neurology. The second one is papilledema, but no focal signs. The third is fever, but no focal signs. The fourth is extracranial signs. And the fifth is no abnormal signs. And we're gonna go through each of those in more detail now. So in patients who present with a headache with altered GCS or focal signs, there are several different potential causes of this. They can be divided into vascular, infective or neoplastic. When we're thinking about vascular causes, um, they're either stroke or a bleed such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a chronic subdural, such might happen after a minor head injury. If you're looking at infective causes, then um, the more obvious ones to consider would be meningitis or encephalitis, but we shouldn't forget a history of foreign travel, in which case patients may have cerebral malaria, or if they're immunocompromised, they might have a cerebral abscess. Um, and then 
Neoplastic tumours, obviously very concerning and they can be primary or secondary. So there are some key considerations we should make on the history uh, when we're seeing someone with a headache. The acuteness of the headache suggests a vascular cause such, a, such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningeal irritation. If you have a subacute onset, so one that's been happening over maybe a few days, then we start to think about an infective cause. And if it's a very chronic onset, a chronic headache, um, then we start considering neoplastic causes. When thinking about the history, um, if there's travel, as I mentioned before, you consider malaria. There may have been exposure to certain um, um, bacteria or fungi or parasites um, that you might have through hobbies or work. And in that instance, we should consider cerebral abscess. Also, contact history. Is there somebody in the family or close friendship group or university who had meningitis? And also the time of the headache. Is it happening more in the early morning when they wake up or when they have strenuous activity? Or is it when they're bending down or coughing? And then certain risk factors as well, such as is there a family history of a brain tumour or has a patient got a condition which makes them immunocompromised, such as HIV. Signs of raised intracranial pressure um, with the headache are that it's worse on waking, that it's aggravated by coughing, vomiting or straining, and it's relieved by lying down. Um, papilledema and focal signs of raised intracranial pressure are very late features, so when you're asking that history, you really need to ask for those specific red flags and not rely on the clinical exam at that point, otherwise you will miss um, underlying pathology. The next grouping of headaches are those with papilledema but no focal signs, and they can be categorised into arterial, uh, where you can get accelerated hypertension um, or a bleed, intracranial, such as mass lesions, hydrocephalus or cerebral edema, and also venous, such as a sinus venous thrombosis. A headache with a fever, um, to some extent that's easier to diagnose. Um, it may just be they have a headache related to a viral infection fever, but we need to be considering that actually is there an infection around the meninges or an encephalitis. A subarachnoid hemorrhage can also present with a fever, so don't just assume because they have a fever that it's um, an infective cause. Um, and of course, extracranial causes of it, as I mentioned, a viral illness, but sinusitis and systemic infections such as malaria and typhoid. The next group of headache are those with extra cranial signs. Um, one cause of this is acute sinusitis. Again, on the previous slide, this can present with a fever, but it may not, which is why it's in a separate category. Typically, this affects the frontal and maxillary sinuses, and the patient may have some tenderness over those areas. Also important to consider is referred pain from the neck, such as in cervical spondylosis, and do ensure you do a full neurological exam to look for myelopathy or radiculopathy. Further extracranial signs with a headache are giant cell arteritis, um, so inflammation of large or medium sized vessels. It happens more frequently in older people, um, and it can be associated with visual changes as well as systemic problems. And certainly if there's anyone with visual changes, they need to be urgently started on steroids and to see a ophthalmologist. It's often associated in 50% of cases with polymyalgia rheumatica. So the patient may complain of pain across their neck and across their shoulders and difficulty lifting their arms because of the pain um, in a chronic nature. Acute glaucoma also um, is an acute cause of a headache, usually very much focused around the eye, again in the older population, um, and they clinically have a red eye that's tender to touch and some blurred vision. The next group is a headache with no abnormal signs. There's a long list of those. Um, these include a tension headache, often felt like a band around the head related to um, stress, uh, a migraine where it may just be pain in the head or people may experience the aura before developing the headache where they get scintillation, so a change in the field of vision which then resolves and then the severe headache and vomiting which is usually unilateral. 
The patient may have ingested some drugs or toxins. Um, for example, if someone is dependent on tramadol, they can get an um, opiate-style headache. Um, Subarachnoid hemorrhage, again, can cause a headache, but have no neurological signs whatsoever associated with it. As I mentioned already, giant cell arteritis um, may cause a headache before the eyes are involved. The cluster headache, um, recurrent headache on one side of the face, it is usually associated with watering of the eye and a loss of sweating in that area. Um, a coital migraine, so pain after sex, and also low sodium. The CT of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can see on a non-contrast CT that blood shines up bright white and that there's infiltration around all of the um, subarachnoid space. So to discuss subarachnoid hemorrhage um, in more detail, because it's not an uncommon way that someone might present to the ED, Two out of three people who present usually have at least one of either a seizure, um, a transient loss of consciousness or a depressed level of consciousness, or they have some focal neurological signs. But a third have just the headache alone, um, which is usually described as an acute sudden onset headache, the worst headache they've ever had, um, and like they've been hit around the back of the head. They often will have neck stiffness, which takes three to 12 hours to develop. Um, and it might not be present in small bleeds. Also, you might see some small intraocular hemorrhage on fundoscopy. Uh, and depending on where an aneurysm is, that, um, that is usually the cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage that pops, depends on the focal neurology you might see. So a posterior cerebral artery aneurysm may cause a third nerve palsy. Um, the sixth nerve palsy usually presents with raised intracranial pressure. And you might get bilateral lower limb weakness with an anterior carotid artery aneurysm and hemiparesis or aphasia with a middle carotid artery aneurysm. But certainly if you see someone who's got a headache and some focal neurology, you're going to be doing a CT scan. So there's no concern that you're going to be missing that in the ED. Other symptoms a patient might present with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, they might have vomiting prior to the headache or be exerting themselves physically. Um, usually that's a very instantaneous onset, so the headache comes on and it comes to maximum effect within a few seconds to minutes. Um, as, as we said, the worst headache that the patient's ever experienced um, in usually all, virtually all patients that present. Um, and certainly any kind of seizures, loss of consciousness or transient symptoms that then go away are very suggestive. So don't just assume because the patient has had some symptoms and they've gone away that there's nothing to worry about. That could um, be a sentinel bleed um, and signify the patient going on to have a much worse bleed in, in due course. So some pitfalls that um, you might experience if you're seeing someone with um, a query subarachnoid hemorrhage is that it could be relieved by simple analgesics um, and also the symptoms are very common in just a benign thunderclap style headache but really there's a diagnosis of exclusion you need to have done everything to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage in the first instance. So 10% of patients that you see with that sudden onset headache will have, have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, if you do a CT within 24 hours it's more than 90% sensitive um, but if you do it in less than 12 hours, it's up to 100% sensitive. However, normal CT still does not rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. And therefore, all patients that you're querying a subarachnoid hemorrhage must be um, referred to the medical team for a lumbar puncture. A completely normal lumbar puncture does rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So a bit more about some more benign headaches. A tension headache usually affects younger patients, usually females. Um, they can either be an acute history of a few hours with photophobia and neck stiffness or a chronic history with diffuse pain around the head um, that feels like a, a pressure in a band. The migraine is very common. Um, usually people say they've had migraines before, there's a family history of it. Don't be um, 
um, fall into the pitfall of someone saying they usually have migraines and now they've got a headache um, and just assuming it's still the same migraine. If they tell you this is the worst headache they've ever had or it's different from my normal headache, that's usually what we hear, it's different, then see this as a new presentation of headache where we need to think about all those other differentials because um, otherwise it's those people you assume have just got a migraine that you will miss serious underlying pathology. It affects 20% of women, 50% of men. Um, there's usually a precipitant to it. They often say the four C's, caffeine, chocolate, cheese, and um, and the fourth C is claret or red wine. Um, these patients usually present with the prodrome of a visual aura or sensory or motor disturbance, and then they have the headache and vomiting. Um, it can be a stroke mimic with um, weakness down one side of the body, but again, assume it's a stroke until proven otherwise. So in summary, acute headache causes about 2.5% of A&E visits of which only 15% will be life-threatening, but it's not an insignificant amount. Um, always think about those key features of a serious headache. So is the onset new? Is it acute? Is it progressing? Are they waking from sleep with it? Is it the worst headache they've ever had? Also, is there any associated photophobia, meningeal irritation, fever, altered mental state, or focal signs? Um, and when you examine the patient, is their neck stiff? they have papilledema, is there pyrexia, are there any pericranial signs, focal neurology or a rash. Of course all of those will help point to the diagnosis but don't forget the patient might not have any of these so please always be thinking about what the possible differentials could be and if there's any doubt then discuss all the cases with the ED registrar or consultant.